what happens when your players decide they want to invest all that gold that they found in the dungeons in a settlement that they've come across or a town or build a town of their own or start a business, start a, a mining business or a lumber business. There's uh, some resources you can use. I'm Tristan. This is Heroes in Homebrew. So this is something that came up recently in my white box campaign. My players have decided that one of the frontier settlements that they've come across and recently protected against a horde of orcs, uh, they've decided that they want to invest their money in this town and help build it up. So it's close to a, a mountain range. They want to build, invest in a mine and it's close to a forest. They want to invest in lumber works. When we started this, I was kind of at a loss. I quickly looked something up in the Blackmore, the first fantasy campaign book that gave me some vague rules that I could use, but I started to look more deeply into it because, you know, if they're going to do this and they're going to make a go of it, I want there to be some, you know, some, some rules that we can work with that you know, can track the progress. So two of the resources that we're going to look at today is the AD&D Dungeon Masters uh, Guide and the Blackmore First Fantasy Campaign Book. I am sure there are many other resources out there that you can use, but these are two that I happen to have on hand that I looked through and I thought it might be helpful to some of you or interesting and something that you could throw into your game as well. So let's take a look at the AD&D Dungeons & Masters Guide and then the Blackmore book. So the AD&D Dungeons & Masters Guide, it's some of the rules that they have in here is more geared towards building a dungeon. Once they build their keep or what have you, it assumes that the players will want to build their own dungeon underneath it. For my purposes, my players are building a mine and this will still work for that. You can see here, there's the, the mining cubic, the volume of rock per eight hours, labor per miner. It has null, halfling, human, gnome, kobold, goblin, orc, dwarf, hobgoblin. But let's assume that, and it even says later on, that things like demi-humans, like, uh, we're not demi-humans, but creatures like gnolls and kobolds and goblins are not going to work for you. So we're going to end up having humans, dwarves, elves, and maybe halflings or gnomes if you have those in the area that are going to be working. It gives you the amount of feet that you can go through in an eight-hour day, and depending on the consistency of the rock, very soft, soft, and hard. Now, I'm not a geologist. I don't know exactly what's considered soft rock and hard rock, so I would just say they can go through 50 feet in a day or like whatever the the median between the two extremes is so if they have say 30 people you would multiply that by 30 and that's how much rock they can go through through day per day now the purpose of my players is they are excavating the rock to build in the town to use for buildings and whatnot so they would also need to build roads uh, they would need to have carts, they would need workers, they would need uh, engineers, things like that. And of course, it says you can have multiple shifts. You can have three, sh if you have enough people, you can have three shifts per day, each, e each working eight hours, but no shift can work more than eight hours. Uh, construction time, so earth excavations, that's digging the earth, but since they are mining in the mountains, that's not necessarily. Uh, applicable but maybe there's an earth floor in these caverns that they're building you might need to clear that earth out stone constructions now this is applicable because they're building buildings they're going to be making houses and other buildings out of the stones not necessarily a fortress but maybe they'll be making walls so there's these rules that I can apply to what my players are doing as well as the wood constructions, because they're going to be taking lumber from the forest. What will probably happen is 
once the excavation of this mountain and the mining starts in earnest in the game, is the players are going to have to come up with the buildings they want to build. And if you see here, so here you have the cons construction and siege constructions, a moat house, shell keep, small castle, etc. So a moat house, I can assume that it would be, you know, the same size as a house is one year to two to eight plus two to eight months. It won't necessarily take a year because depending on how many people we're, we have working on it, and see, so time assumes that an architect has prepared plans in advance and that normal costs are expended in construction. If additional monies are spent, time is reduced as noted for stone constructions. Here, it has a uh, stone building. And this is a single course, one foot thick of dressed or field stone with 120 feet of outside walls. So 120 feet, I, I would say that would be like the exterior. It could be smaller than that. But then the more gold you put into um, the construction, the more people you put in will reduce the labor time in total. Let's look at the construction time before we were looking at, it had the list of the different constructions. Here we actually have how much time it's going to be reduced by, by adding money to it, by like how much money you're going to pump in. So let's assume stone constructions for now. Fortress-like stone constructions take about one week per 10 cubic foot section. Adding 50% to the expenditure will double the rate of construction, but to triple the rate of construction, expenditure must be increased to 250%, uh, which is the maximum increase in construction rate. Normal stolen buildings, as shown on the cost list, require four months to construct, including interior work, all times assuming building materials are on hand, quarry work and transportation, if any, are additional cost and time factors, architect costs are also additional. So all these things are what my players are going to have to take into account. First, they need to, to mine the stone. They need to get architects. They need to get engineers. They need to build it. So it's going to take several months for just one building to be built. Depending on what my player's design is, they are going to have to factor in all these costs into their total cost of the building. Now, for the most part, this is a village, so a lot of the buildings are going to be very simple. Door, a few windows, maybe like some walls on the interior, and that's about it. But the fact that they are doing this is going to push them to go explore more dungeons, get more coin, bring it up. And it's also going to push them to bring people from the known world or known lands to this village that to say, hey, we've got work, we're expanding. So they, they're creating their own economy. Now, I think... Ultimately, their goal, or at least I know for a fact one of my players' goals, is that they want to create a town that will and could eventually like spread and they spread their territory to become more powerful. Now, they're only fourth level, almost fifth level right now. But as we go on, if they start doing this now, it'll create, they can create this sort of duchy or barony of their own that could feasibly compete with what's in the known world. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the things that are in the AD&D Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, it's a great resource if you want to go pick it up. Uh, you can buy a PDF copy on drive-thru. That's what I did. But is just to give you an idea, you, don't, you can alter these rules, of course, to suit your own needs. But to give you an idea of... The fact that like all of this was thought of beforehand. This is not something I've seen in more modern games like fifth edition or anything like that. I this is really kind of like an old school mentality of like we're gonna build these things. And actually maybe it's in the fifth edition Dungeon Masters Handbook, but or Dungeon Masters Guide, but I don't think not not to this extent where it tells you like 
the pricing for each type of variable in your building. Now, something that's also interesting is what's in the Blackmore First Fantasy campaign book. Um, it's very old. You have to like, you have to like Google Blackmore First Fantasy campaign PDF and you should be able to find a link for it. I don't think it's available on Judges Guild anymore. It's not available on, uh, it's like one of those things that's just out there, but really hard to actually find. But, and I, I don't even know where I got it. I just found it in all my documents. But let's, I'm going to show you something in it that really kind of triggered my imagination when I was reading it and made me think of like how you can really change your campaign structure from being just like go to dungeon, come back to town, go to dungeon, come back to town, explore wilderness, come back to town. Like really get your campaign to start building out and creating you know, a world for like your players are invested in these towns. Blackmark kind of built out from wargaming. So the players had their own sort of areas of the world that they built out. So th this book, it's got a section called internal investments where it tells you how fast, how long it takes to build roads, how expensive it is. Uh, for instance, your roads, see price list for cost. Will take one man that many days to build a road one mile. So 900 days because it costs 900 gold per mile. More men will complete the work that much faster, but no more than 100 men can work on one mile of road at a time. So then it also has optional rules for if it's, there's weather, it's going to slow down work. Um, the prices for bridges, canals, inns and the price for the furnishings for the inns so again if your players want to build themselves an inn they can do it and you have the prices be like okay well design me your design your inn you're gonna have to get an architect you're gonna have to pay for the architect and all this takes the money that they have been getting in the dungeons and bringing back to town so they're leveling up but they're spending a vast amount of money on building out their world which is pushing them to go and find more gold but the other thing is things like my players quarry for instance there's a return on their investment so the money that they invest in whatever structures they're building say if they're building an inn or a a mine that money is going to have a return on their investment they're generating their own wealth from their investment in it. Just like, you know, how business works. In uh, the Blackmore First Fantasy campaign, they has the rules for hunting and armories and animal breeding, uh, what the religion is going to change in your town, how the exploration in the surrounding regions is going to affect the town, uh, rules for shipbuilding, farming, so you like farming, you will get a 10 to 20% return. So this is what I used at first when my players said they wanted to start a mine. I used this rule for farming. I said, okay, you're going to get a 20% return on your, your investment because you're investing into this town. And I just, I want, so I wanted to make the decision quickly and not mull it over during game time. So that's what we went with, which is fine. They're happy with that. Uh, fishing, trapping, tourism for your town, and arrival of new persons. This is another thing that I needed sorry, because they're, they're in a town or a village that is really just starting. I said the majority of the buildings were still just tents and whatnot. And some of, there's some wood structures, like there's only one main large dining hall for the entire town to, to eat in. So they're really starting from scratch. But the arrival of new persons is going to be important for them because right now it's winter, so the path to the uh, the other side of the mountain range where there's the known uh, known world and, you know, established cities and stuff, they're going to have to send out envoys and get people to come. And the more people that come, the more workers there are for 
what they need to do and things will get done faster. So then you have land and sea trade, uh, how goods are sold off in a capital city. So if we discover that there are goods in this town where my players are that are not available on the other side of the mountain range, if we can build a road and create some sort of uh, trade route, then that's going to be more income for their city and more wealth for everyone in it. And then here we have the price list for what it costs to build certain things. So you have roads, cleared, standard, Roman type, a canal, wooden bridge, stone bridge, and then also for building shields and weapons and armor. This is not the purchase price, it's the the, the building cost. So you could feasibly, if it's a full leather armor for a horse is 90 gold pieces, the craftsman who's in that town that's building it can sell it for 110 gold pieces or 120 gold pieces. So there's a whole like economy that you can create in your game that really creates a, a new dynamic to what's going on and gives your players a motivation to go into those dungeons and get that gold to invest in the town because now they are pushing all that money towards something and which is only growing their wealth and their power in that town and in time they can start you know building armies and going out going out and you can you know have yourselves battles and conquering new areas sort of motivates your players to why they're actually going into these dungeons beyond just oh you're an adventurer and you're just want to go into the dungeons for gold so now like now we are actually creating that world and saying why are you doing that so because our game is more the players having their own motivations and that's what a lot of sandbox style games are is the players have to create the motivations for the characters beyond just well this is happening in the world and you have to go out and stop it it's kind of mundane but at the same time it's mundane in a way that is pushing the players to kind of do what they want to do so they can say well we're building this town up and one of my players is a cleric and he's converted all pretty much all the town to his religion you know they're creating their own you know nation state basically what's going to happen is i'm going to go over a lot of these rules more in depth i'm going to create the rules for my game out of them to say okay well this is what it's going to take this is how much time it's going to take like in game time to create what you want to create so if if this little town is only 100 people or 120 people right now come spring you're going to have to push to go get more people from the other side to come and build out this town and then create roads and stuff i think it's going to be a lot of fun at least like to me it's something different that i've seen than uh, what i've played in TTRPGs before and I think it's something like it's maybe not it's, it's not for everyone it's not for every table but if you really want to get your players invested in that world invested in the world you've created and invested in that campaign and kind of have one of those campaigns that goes on for years and years and the players and their characters are really a part of it this is possibly a way for you way to go this is possibly a way to get your players really invested in what's going on in the world because now they are they have ownership of pieces of that world so if something happens they are more motivated to deal with it than anything else i'm really enjoying this blackmore first fantasy campaign book has a lot of interesting ideas in it that you can like pull out and sort of use in your own campaign to kind of create something different than just a straightforward dungeon crawling, hex crawling campaign. And that's it for me. Save a seat for me at your table.